Discussing a new kind of leadership, please welcome Dia Sims, the president of Combs Enterprises, here with the host of WNYC's All of It and an Atlantic contributor, Allison Stewart. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being with us. Nice to see you, Dia. Oh, good to see you. So to give a sense of what's in Dia's portfolio, Combs Enterprises includes the brands Bad Boy Entertainment, the clothing lines Sean John and Zach Posen, Ciroc Vodka, De Leon Tequila, the Blue Flame ad agency, Bad Boy Touring, Revolt Films, Revolt Media and TV, and the Combs Foundation. If you go, that's the portfolio. That's the end of our panel. <laughs> <laughs> and if you go to the, the website and you look at the C-suite, it's all people of color, half women. Sean Combs has also founded a charter school as part of the foundation. Yes. And in 2017, Forbes put his estimated wealth at 820 million. So we're gonna talk a little bit about Dia's rise, how she started there as an assistant, a little bit about how they've been able to cultivate a culture, a culture that looks towards the future. And that was gonna be the end of the discussion, but then last night, a little news broke, there was a leak. Dia has a brand new project she's gonna be working on. She's going to be leaving Combs Enterprises with Sean's blessing. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Not, you had a big release plan last week. <laughs> Pesky reporters got the story. <laughs> so, Dia, what had been your original plan? You're a little girl. Oh, golly. Hmm, well, that was a long time ago. And uh, honestly, this sounds extremely like Pollyannish, and, and, but I did very much grow up in a, you know, do what you love, right? My dad was um, a police sergeant. My mother worked in a variety of jobs until she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Um, and this was like a woman who would get up every morning, run three miles, come make breakfast, take us home. And she started to be coming, um, you know, when her movement began to deteriorate, it was pretty significant for her. Um, mm -hmm. So she stayed at home, which, although obviously the disease was hard to watch, um, I know for a fact that I was able to benefit by her being home and being able to spend so much time with her um, on a regular basis. One of the things that was interesting, I think, for me growing up and didn't realize it at the time was I grew up in a neighborhood uh, called East Elmhurst in Queens, New York, right near LaGuardia Airport and also Rikers Island. Uh, <laughs> that's for another day. Um, and in that area, there was this burgeoning of hip hop. So if you're familiar with Salt and Pepper and Kid and Play, um, a gentleman by the name of Herbie Lovebug, a bit of a precursor to Puff Daddy, Brother Love, Diddy, whatever you know him by. Um, so literally I would be like a kid and in my backyard I would see like Salt and Pepper practicing their dance moves over and over and over again. And um, you know, I, Kid and Play having block parties or them shooting videos for Kwame and the famous polka dotted move, anybody remembers that movement. Um, and what was interesting to witness was this like cool cultural hobby all of a sudden turn into a like a significant industry. So a few years later, there's a full feature film and movies across the United States called House Party, right? I start to see them opening up barbershops locally. Like now they're actually writing checks to the local schools. And obviously from nine to 13, I don't think I consciously realized it, but I don't think it was a coincidence that I ended up then working for you know, Puff Daddy for 14 years later and saying like, hey, wait a minute, this hip hop is bigger than music. This is an entire culture that's now a trillion dollar global industry. That's right now the number one on streamed music source um, on Spotify and um, thinking through like what are the how do we actually build our culture economically how do we start to build real legacy wealth through this platform you have a really interesting way you got there though you worked for the Department of Defense oh, yeah. you worked for a pharmaceutical giant yes. you worked in club promotion and so now you're president of a multi-tiered entertainment company what do those all have in common hmm well um, I think very much on target with what we're talking about today. I often get asked a question about like, oh, hip hop, it's so misogynistic. Like, what's it like? Like, it's kind of like when I work at the Department of Defense. <laughs> 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 uh, like, the, the truth of the matter is, uh, there is no industry at the C-suite level that has a firm hold on the lack of diversity, right? It is a widespread problem and it requires a widespread solution. Um, I worked in so many different industries. Um, DOD, not too far from where we are today. I, you know, threw parties in my 20s, not too far from where we are <laughs> today. Um, and uh, I talk a lot about being a 22-year-old kind of young woman in either a room with 
uh, generals and men who had been working for Boeing for 50 years and confused about like what would I contribute in that room, or whether I was throwing a party down the block and had to make it clear that I was there for work and not interested in being you know smacked on the butt on my way to you know <laughs> to order to order drinks for everyone. And I started this kind of mental thing which I call now like the clipboard effect, um, which I don't think anybody has clipboards anymore. But at the time, myself and the women that I work with, I would literally like in the beginning of the day like I would go to Staples and buy a bunch of them and hand out physical clipboards because if you had a clipboard in your hand, you were treated differently. The you gentlemen in the club, they would not, you know, they would say, oh, excuse me, which way or how can I get it? It was a very, if you put it down, it was a very different interaction. So for me, um, particularly as I started to become in heavier and heavier rooms, I would mentally think through like, what is the way, what is the gravitas in the way I enter a room? What is the level of information I'm gonna bring to the table that's kind of this, I don't know, metaphorical clipboard effect? How did you first meet Sean Combs, PW? So the way I received this, so, so actually, um, uh, I grew up in the mid-90s, so I don't even know if he knows this, but I was definitely, we definitely were in some of the same circles in, in, at that time period, but the way this job came to be was I worked in radio, another, another job, um, <laughs> and, and advertising sales, and I inherited um, the music labels in New York City at this like upstart hip-hop station for Clear Channel. Um, and one of the executives who worked with him reached out to me and was like, He's, Sean is looking to hire a new chief of staff. Would you be interested in applying for the job? I had no relevant experience. Um, and I even asked her, I was like, oh, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm always down for an interview, but like, tell me you know, what, were you, what, what you're thinking about this. She really was like, you send emails at like 3 a.m., so I feel like you guys have a lot in common because he does not <laughs> sleep. <laughs> um, so took the interview, interview was maybe five or six minutes. He has like a terrific poker face. Um, I usually think I know, like, oh, I nailed it. I walked out, I was like, mm, I don't know. Um, they called and said, look, he would like to hire you, but you don't have a lot of experience in managing large teams, so would you be willing to come on as the executive assistant? Um, and I never really have been concerned about titles. I'm more concerned about, is there a place, is this a place I can learn? I was very much like, you can call me the janitor. This is what I want to make financially, and I want to have an opportunity to mm -hmm. grow. And they were like, okay, come on over. A lot of people do get hung up in titles. Yeah. Why didn't you? You know, I feel, um, I've always felt really good about the idea that you can, you know, you can, you can be the master, right, of, of what your path looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and the most important thing is getting in the door, right? And for me, I had, as, as you said, I worked in a variety of fields, but having looked at like Sean Combs trajectory and path, I was like, this is a guy I can really learn from. And I'm a super geek, and it's most important to me to be like, can I be learning something every second, every minute of the day? So I didn't really care what I was called. I was like, I want to go to a place where I can learn. It doesn't work out, I'll go do the next thing. It's interesting, you I like your DIA rules about the clipboard. The other one was when you first got there, you didn't put anything personal up. Yeah. Why did you not want to have anything personal? And, and let me first say, I actually don't recommend that. And I'm very impressed and excited about like, the movement now where I feel like women are like, no, I'm coming to bring my whole self to work, and it is what it is. Um, I started at Combs Enterprises the week after I turned 30. And I'm now, and I turned 44 tomorrow. I and uh, <laughs> and um, I was very super conscious about the fact that this was an industry where, yeah, this was a lot of celebrity. There was sometimes confusion about um, how women should be treated. So I was very intentional. I had not one personal effect on my desk. I was always really civil and pleasant. But as you can imagine, in this industry, there's tons of parties. But I would literally go into work like, oh, this is so fun. Excuse me, excuse me. Hey, Puff, I'm going to need you to sign off on this. Yep, oh, you have a question about that? We're up 6%. I'm back if you need me. I'm back at the office. Um, and I think it just set the appropriate tone for the way I expect this to be treated, but also just real clarity around why I belonged in that room. The nature of working with somebody like Sean is I needed to be equally as impactful, and these are like real scenarios, with the royal family in London as I would be in a studio in East New York and Brooklyn and making sure that these 15 rappers were on time for their studio session. Um, so that requires an ability to you know, be myself everywhere I went, but ensure that as soon as you come in, you know I mean business. I know you mean business, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I talked a little bit about at the top what your, what your C-suite looks like, and at Revolt Media, it's 67% people of color, 50% yes. of the women at the CVP level, at the senior vice president level, are women. Um, yeah, it's really something to be proud of. What advice would you give a legacy company where that, something like that seems almost impossible? 
Or someone might tell you it's impossible, let me put it that way. Yeah, I mean, the reality is all things are possible if you're willing to put the commensurate resources into it. Um, is it enormously challenging? There's no question of that. I'm sure we've all seen um, the research that shows basically after 150 people, right, the, you start to lose so much efficiency in a company. Although, if you're like the federal government who has two million employees, it'd be difficult to have a bunch of sub-factions of 150 people. This is something that you can think about in the way you approach diversity. Um, if you're at an organization where you need to be dedicated to it at the global level, don't get me wrong, but are there opportunities to say, how do I hyper-focus on these sub-segments so that I know I'm doing it right? What, you know what I mean? How do I go into this particular, into my tech group, and figure out how I'm really disciplined about ensuring that we have blind interviews, that we actually use AI for the initial screening so that individual bias doesn't creep into it. That we pay attention to the effect that when you have only one minority or one woman in the final hiring, well, actually, the, the correct stat is actually, if you have one minority in the final hiring group, right, it's statistically 0% that that person gets hired. If you have two or more for minorities, it goes up to 194 times more likely. For women, it goes up to 74 times more likely. So it's easy to say, let's have at least two minorities in the recruitment pool. That data bears that out. That's an easy thing that you can actually put into practice. Um, I would also say the reality is, although workplace diversity is a huge and gaping issue in America, it is a reflection of a much larger issue. So it's hard to be diverse at work if you're not diverse at home. It's just, it's just mm -hmm. the truth. Um, and we all tend to self-segregate in whatever group you're in. Um, so it's important to be intentional about creating and developing legitimate relationships across serious lines of difference. Not like a Pisces and a Libra, right? Like serious <laughs> lines of difference um, because it's difficult. I've, had, I've, I've been grateful that I've been able to have relationships with, you know, C-suite of huge multinational organizations building that, that can pull me aside and say, like, we want to do better, but we don't know anybody else like you. And that now, I, I know people who will be offended by that and say, that's a ridiculous statement, but I'm happy to have an open, clear conversation. I'll be like, I got you. What do you need? You need more? I know, I know thousands of brilliant, but I'm not a unicorn. There's a million people like me, and mm -hmm. if you don't know them, let me be the bridge. It's interesting. I, people talk about the pipeline. When you talk to people about diversity issues, a lot of times they'll say, but the pipeline, but the pipeline. But there can be more than one pipeline. I mean, it doesn't have to just be everybody coming out of Wharton and Tuck. I mean, you got, I, I think about HBCUs and Greek organizations. There's all kinds of places to recruit. Yeah, I think the pipeline is a little bit of a misnomer, but I, because to your point, there are historically black colleges and universities. There are the what's called the divine nine. If you go to the black fraternities, right? That's particularly for 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 African Americans. But these type of things exist in every diverse segment. The, you know, again, I think you're dealing with a bigger issue, though, that there are sometimes pipeline issues, and not to, you know, this may be a little bit of a heavy topic, but I think we need to be able to deal with these kind of things in real life. We live in a country, actually, you know, when you look at history one of the only countries where in times of slavery, the amount of anti-literacy laws was a real thing. Mostly everywhere else in the world, if you were in a slave population, you could still read, right? So here, up for about, from the 1400s mm -hmm. to the late 1800s, you, would, you were not allowed to read by law. You would be potentially, you know what I mean? It's a big deal. So there are legitimate like, things mm -hmm. that, this, that, this com that this country has to kind of deal with to overcome and say like, well, maybe um, tech is not being taught at, at, at the early ages, or maybe there is a real dearth. And that's the case, what are we doing collectively to account for that, to make sure that the companies are truly diverse, which is actually just good for business. It's actually just good for profits. Um, so it's worth, I think, the short-term appropriate level of investment for the long-term ROI, both financially, and it's also just the right thing to do for the moral fabric of the country. Let's talk about your new business for a moment. Because this is an opportunity to start a business the way you want to, and you're going into the CBD business. Yes. So, 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 so I often talk about um, industries and real innovation. Sometimes have to start from scratch, right? So we often mistake improvement for innovation, um, and that if you want to 
really build something in the right way, sometimes you just have to actually build it from scratch. Like iPhones didn't come from Palm Pilots, Netflix didn't come from Blockbuster, right? A lot of times like really crazy, even the automotive industry mm -hmm. didn't come from horses, right? <laughs> so it starts a lot of times um, from scratch. Even though we're relatively far in, in the, the cannabis and in, in the US and the um, hemp-derived CBD business, we're already seeing that in the United States less than 5% of um, dollars being made in the industry are going back into diverse communities. There are literally no women um, in most of the meetings that I've been in um, in the past few years. And I felt like, you know what, this is at least a young enough industry that we could get in and make a change right now. Um, I mentioned that my dad was a police sergeant in New York. And when he, where he grew up, uh, it was well known that like, the police would go after minorities. He actually grew up in a very like anti-police environment. But he taught my family that if you want to make a change, you have to become a part of the system. It's much easier actually to change it often from within. So he started the first uh, group under the Internal Affairs, this is like in the 80s, to train officers on um, civility and discourse in black and Hispanic uh, in, uh, yeah. neighborhoods in a very different way, but kind of with the same approach. It's kind of how I'm viewing the cannabis industry right now in North America. Um, there's an exciting opportunity, um, an amazing opportunity in like a millennium where we can actually change the future of American business, right? So if you think about um, what the gold rush did in terms of the railroad industry and the development of the West and how we still benefit from this day from what happened then, we're living in a time like that right now. For me, I couldn't sit on the sidelines and not like jump in. Um, but I'm equally excited about the commercial opportunity as I am about, okay, this is an opportunity where like what we did at Combs, we can be really prescriptive about ensuring that there is appropriate levels of diversity in, uh, you know, in religious identity and gender identity and um, you know and proper diversity and build it from scratch and I did you know I've been talking to Sean about this for a year and got his blessing uh, <laughs> to move forward and hopefully we'll be doing something cool together um, and we're, we're, we're excited about what's to come in that space and what's the name of the company gonna be burn the burn, burn group BRN BRN <laughs> burn group and, when, <laughs> and when's your big official announcement so people can look for um, it? it will be uh, the first week of October all right yes we wish you good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us, Dan.